welcome to Bird for Joy, a show about discovering all the different ways that bird watching can bring joy into our lives. I'm Candy Lanfite, your gracious host and fledgling birder. Here at Bird for Joy, we focus on listening and watching the birds around us, being curious and learning what the birds have to teach us about joy, life, and ourselves. So grab your favorite beverage, settle on your perch, and let's get into today's episode. If you've been following the Bird for Joy podcast, you probably noticed I haven't released an episode in almost two weeks. We spent eight days in D.C. visiting our youngest daughter and then took the long way back home by train. Traveling by train in a sleep at car for 30 hours was quite an experience, but in a good way. I had every intention of podcasting while on vacation but I didn't care for the sound quality of the headphone mic that I brought along. So I thought I'd share my vacation birding adventures in this week's episode. This trip proves that even without organized birding events, birding can be done almost anywhere. It's funny, once I started bird watching, I began noticing birds every single place I go. While I'm driving, or riding in the car, walking down a sidewalk, lounging poolside at the hotel, sitting at a cafe, watching out the window, at the airport runway before our plane took off, from a boat during our tour of the Chesapeake Bay. I even watched birds by train every time we stopped at a station. I think it's safe to say that I've got birds on the brain all the time. I may or may not have a slight obsession with birds. Just saying. So instead of sharing my vacation birdie full adventures in a and then this happened story format, I thought it would be kind of fun and interesting to tell them in short vignettes, mostly because that's the way my brain works. The backyard birds took priority over my own packing. I couldn't even think about packing for my trip until I made sure that all of my potted porch plants, the bird baths, and the bird feeders were dealt with. I had devoted my mornings during one of the hottest summers on record, watering and caring for the plants, cleaning and filling bird baths, and filling my feeders almost on a daily basis. Ten days away tugged at my conscience and toyed with my anxiety, but I had come up with a plan, a plan where my plants and backyard birds would survive my absence. The front and back porch plants were carried, towed, pushed to the corner of the northeast side of the house. The heaviest of the pots took a magic carpet ride, me dragging them down the length of our 50-foot wooden porch on an old rug. Despite the rug snagging on random screw heads, the method worked like a charm. Vinegar and elbow grease did the trick on all three bird baths, and those two found their way to the corner of the house one of which sits on the ground for my bunnies and squirrels. The feeder fairy did a spectacular job on the bird feeders throughout the backyard before refilling them, all hanging from their respective tree branches. With zip ties, a secured sprinkler perched atop the wrought iron tabletop and its hose led to an automatic timer at the spigot. Credit goes to my husband, of course, for setting up that timer. With the sprinkler on, I rearranged the plant and bird bath ensemble to perfection, each to receive copious daily sprinkles every morning for 30 minutes. Satisfied and soaked, I went inside to pack. My eyes honed in on the grackles hopping along the runway and in the scorched field outside the minuscule, squarish, thick window. Their quirky behavior occupied my attention during the flight attendant safety demonstration. Sorry, but when it comes to birds, I'm like a kid in a candy store, a dog with a bone, or better yet, a squirrel. Before our plane jetted off, I send out a hope to the universe. May all the birds in our path stay safe. You know you're a birder when you whip out your phone camera scope 
and a tripod sitting poolside of the hotel and pay no mind to anyone witnessing your peculiar behavior. But the adorable bumblebee colored burb plucking coneflower seeds 12 feet from your lounge chair is not an everyday experience for this newbie birder. The American Goldfinch. What a handsome bird with its summer yellow and jet black plumage and its forehead dipped in ink. And either the little guy was very hungry or he realized that this birder needed some goldfinch in her life because he dined for 10 minutes, allowing me to get some great footage on camera. If you're interested, I posted a video and pics on my Instagram at Bird for Joy. Prepare yourselves for so much darn cuteness. The outdoor seating area at the cafe across from our hotel is basically a free bird buffet. Tiny house sparrows plunge in and out of the dish bin at one end, flitting off with their loot. A few European starlings and several grackles hop along the ground under tables, pouncing on every crumb dropped. They've noticed that I am a very messy eater and drop pieces of my toast often. Well, me and the toddler in the high chair two tables over. He and I go undetected by the adults around us, but at least the birds are happy and full. Being a human inside a birdhouse is something everyone should experience. And I don't mean a plastic or wood birdhouse, obviously, but in an actual bird habitat at the zoo, where the wild birds are loose and flying all around. The rush of air against my skin as the cedar waxwing fluttered past me is indescribable. Trust me, I tried to put it into words, but the only thing that I came up with is ethereal. A flash of blue streaks past me and perches on a branch two feet away. A male indigo bunting so close I can reach out and touch him. Of course I don't, because, well, one, I'm a rule follower. But even more, being in close proximity to nature is such a gift, and one I don't want to end. If I had been alone that day, I would have stayed for hours in that birdhouse. Did you know that a young Asian brown wood owl's downy head feathers are so soft it feels as if you're touching air? Softer than cotton or anything else I've ever felt. The rest of the owl's feathers are silky soft and dark chocolate brown and tan, which reminds me of a Reese's peanut butter cup. As I run the back of my hand down the back of the female owl, I wonder what it would be like to bury my nose and nuzzle the fluff on top of her head. In an uncanny twist, she turns her head in my direction, blinking quarter-sized dark eyes and her razor-sharp beak only inches from my face. I reconsider and take a step back. Her trainer chuckles at the three of us as we pose for a photo. As we leave the National Smithsonian Zoo that day, I realize how very lucky I am. I got to pet an owl. How many other human beings can say that? Okay, so this next part isn't to get anyone's feathers in a ruffle, but after spending a week in the D.C. area and encountering this species that I'm going to mention next, I am shocked and disturbed by what I've learned. There are three bird species in the D.C. area, and by the way, they are the only three species in North America that are not protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. They are the house sparrow the European starling, and the pigeon, also known as the rock dove. Although, some states may restrict management, and by management, we're talking about controlling the population of these species, such as habitat modifications, repellents, trapping, and relocation, fertility control, toxicants, and yes, even euthanasia. For the most part, it is not illegal to quote-unquote control the populations of these three species. The nestwatch.org website, which is part of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, offers ways to quote-unquote passively control them by where you place nest boxes, avoid feeding the type of seeds that these three species prefer, or actively controlling them 
by removing or even, quote unquote, harassing the birds, removing their nests to discourage them, or tricking the birds into incubating eggs that will never hatch. They call this incubation fake out. Here are the methods vigorously shaking the eggs, freezing, oiling, boiling, or poking holes in the eggs, rendering them non viable. Another naturalist website suggested that you just throw the nest and the eggs on the ground every time you find one. Can I just say here that I am appalled, mortified, and frankly embarrassed at the brutish, murderous tactics to control these birds? I'm laughing because I, I'm almost in disbelief. I have seen far more blue jays bully smaller songbirds than a common house sparrow. Other bully bird species are crows, grackles, mockingbirds, gray catbirds, brown headed cowbirds, the red winged blackbird, red headed woodpeckers, tyrant flycatchers, magpies, and again, not to ruffle anyone's feathers, but have you watched the hummingbirds at feeders? Sheesh, those beautiful winged creatures are downright ruthless with each other. But we almost never hear about how to keep away these birds that I've mentioned away from our feeders or about eliminating them from existence. In my opinion, these three species get a pretty bad rap and my philosophy is every birdie is welcome. And here's a little fun fact I read on the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's website. All of the European starlings in North America descended from 100 birds set loose in New York's Central Park in the early 1890s. The birds were intentionally released by a group, ready for this, who wanted America to have all the birds that Shakespeare ever mentioned. It took several tries, but eventually the population took off, obviously. Through a bit of research, I also learned that for different reasons, we brought over pigeons and house sparrows as well. Now, before I hop down off my birdhouse, I'll add one more thought. Since breeding house sparrows eat insects such as beetles, flies, caterpillars, and aphids to the feed their young, I have a feeling that eradicating this species would cause a huge ripple effect on our ecosystem, and not in a good way. At Union Station, a gorgeous neoclassical masterpiece by famed architect and planner Daniel Burnham, the gentleman checking our tickets asked what my t-shirt said. It says, I don't always watch birds. Oh wait, yes I do, I told him. He smiled and then shared the story of the snowy owl that caused quite a hoot at Union Station back in December 2022 and January 2023. He laughed, telling me that birders and non-birders alike flocked the station's grounds just to catch a glimpse of the owl. Once aboard our train, bound for New Orleans, my curious owl-occupied brain had to find out more. The young, what thought to be female snowy owl, onlookers named Duchess, appeared in December of 2022 and hunted nightly in the D.C. area on mostly pigeons and rats. Duchess also made appearances at Reagan National Airport, the National Mall, McMillan Reservoir, and the MedStar Washington Hospital Center. Of course, since we were visiting just this past week, I didn't have the honor of spotting this owl, who, see what I did there, is most likely back where they spend most of their time in the Arctic tundra. But what a sight she must have been. Back home, my corner plant spot was successful. Everything thrived, including the visiting backyard birds, the sweet bunnies, and of course, the silly squirrels. The very first thing I did after rolling my suitcase inside the house, yes, before unpacking, was run outside and refill my bird feeders. This week's episode was slightly longer than usual, so I cut the All About That Bird series. It will return for next week's episode. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. If you are enjoying the show, I would love it if you would follow or subscribe, 
rate, review, and then let others know about the podcast so we can continue to build a community of like-minded birders. A big shout out to composer Jonathan Boyle for his cheerful show music called Plucking Happy. The spoken lyrics were written and read by me, and the full version with lyrics will follow this episode. Until next time, stay chirpy, my friends, and get outside, feel the sun upon your face and the wind in your hair, and bird for joy's sake. Bird for joy's sake. When you're needing more, a new beginning, feeling lost, alone, or blue, go into nature. Stroll to the melodious tunes of birdsong. Let it refresh your soul, fill your heart, lift your spirits. Yes, bird, for joy's sake. Witness the winged wonders flitting, fluttering, playing hide and tweet. Is there anything else so sweet? I think not. Well, save for the chitter-chatter of my own nestlings as they filled my early days. But sigh, no more, for they have long left the nest, and I now strive to find myself once again, discovering new things that I do best. Bird, for joy's sake, for our feathered friends have much joy to share, and it doesn't cost a dime, only time. And I don't know about you, but I am willing to give, to have a chance to live out my days, filled with curiosity, hope, and wonder, learning patience, the art of slowing down and being fully present, living in the moment, something I have long strived to achieve. Bird, for joy's sake, and keep looking up. Let their constant cheer infect you, their tenacity provide you with lessons of never giving up and looking on the brighter side of life. Prepare for entertainment with their quirky, chirpy silliness. Oh my, so much cuteness, happiness, and whimsy. You can't help but smile. And suddenly, you'll discover worries cease, frustrations fade, chaos calms, and troubles melt away like snow in the spring. You will find yourself looking up and forward into the horizon, Surrounded by song, hope and happiness perched in your heart, feeling renewed and fulfilled. Go out into nature, take a stroll, let the avifauna rejuvenate your soul, and bird for joy's sake.